If you're a first-time caller, call Art at 702-727-1222. Come up nine. There is breaking news in ufology. Peter Davenport is here along with Robert A. Fairfax, Director of Investigations for MUFON in Washington. And there's been a major case with multiple witnesses, one that's really going to blow your mind. They're going to tell you that story in a moment. They've just completed the investigation, if you ever actually complete one of these things. Also, there is breaking news in Chicago. Peter Davenport will have that story for you, or near Chicago somewhere, where a very large, guess what, once again, triangular object has been sighted. That and a lot more coming right up. So, the old say... Peter Davenport is the director of the National UFO Reporting Center in Seattle, Washington, and he's been sporadically doing reports on this program now for... I don't know. Uh, how long has it been, Peter? My first appearance uh, was on Dreamland on Sunday, the 19th of February, 1995, Art. 95, huh? Four years now. All right, four years. And investigating, take, taking reports actually first, collating them, and uh, occasionally investigating reports. And this falls into the category of Peter actually went out on the road and investigated what we're about to tell you about. Um, I also have with me Robert A. Fairfax, who is Director of Investigations for MUFON in Washington State, and that should be self-explanatory. Uh, Robert, welcome to the program. Hello, Art. Uh, I wanted to say one thing to begin with. We haven't completed the whole investigation, just the initial uh, interviews. We Yeah, I kind of figured that. Right. It, it really probably never ends fully. Uh, I wonder how many of that, in fact, that's a pretty good question, actually, for Peter, or for, for either one of you. How many of these investigations actually come to a complete conclusion, uh, an end, case yeah. closed? That's a very good question, Art, and I think I can honestly say that I don't think any one of these investigations that we've handled in the last four, four and a half years has ever been closed. Yeah, I had a feeling. Yep. Um, so, that said... What the heck happened? What, what did you two do? What, what, what were the reports, and where did you go? Yeah, it is a fascinating story. I find this one particularly alarming, Art, and I think our listeners tonight will get a feeling of that. Why don't I start off, Bob, with a just a brief introduction of what happened. Maybe you can fill in the blanks, and uh, then we'll play about a 77-second tape of the first report we got about this just about two weeks ago. All right. But in a nutshell, what happened is this. On Thursday, the 25th of February, 1999, about two or three minutes before noon, a group of forestry workers in the state of Washington, not far from the uh, Mount St. Helens, which blew its top out here a couple decades ago, mm -hmm. three of those workers saw what at first they thought was a parachute drifting over the ridge to the south of them and drifting into the valley of the, the, to the north of their location. They were out doing forestry work, which they've done for a decade or decade and a half, many of them in that area. They were astonished by this thing. The first three to see the object quickly called the attention of their co-workers to it, and they watched that object for, they estimate, three, four, maybe five minutes, and the long and the short of it is that object drifted towards a herd of elk, and it was seen by 14 witnesses, allegedly, to pick one of the adult elk off, uh, off the ground, pick it up out of the forest, and do a circle with it, and then start rising, rising faster and faster and faster, and it disappeared from their sight to the northeast. They abducted an elk? A full, fully grown adult elk, apparently, and it flew off to the northeast. Apparently the object, and I'm going to let Bob fill in some of the details that I've skipped over here. Apparently the object, as it, after it picked up the elk, started slowly trying to gain altitude, apparently. And as it got higher, this elk apparently got closer and closer to the bottom of the disk. And by the time the object was above the observers, they it's could like, no longer see the elk. It's like it had some kind of tractor beam on the elk. In other words, could they see a beam of any, anything? Um, no, they didn't see a beam, and it appeared that the hull may have even come in contact with the top of the head before the elk started disappearing into the bottom of the craft. How big was the craft, Bob? The craft wasn't much bigger than the elk. Uh, the elk is 
<laughs> we're talking about a 500 pound animal. Oh, that's pretty big. Yeah, it stands four and a half feet at the shoulder and about six and a half feet from nose to tail. Now, this is a pretty wild story, folks. Um, yeah. Let's go back to the beginning. How many people, pray tell, saw this? Fourteen. Fourteen witnesses. Fourteen are. Fourteen witnesses. And we were able to interview three of them. And, of course, one, a good investigator is always skeptical. Yes. Particularly in a case like this where you're being told just absolutely incredible incredible things but Bob and I just a week ago tomorrow morning or tomorrow afternoon met with three of those 14 witnesses and I'll let Bob speak for his own part but my impression of the people we met with the people who were involved with this case are as sober-minded and modest and soft-spoken perhaps even self-effacing a group of people as you'll ever run across they didn't want any publicity I take it they want absolutely no publicity that's part of the reason I'm pleased to have two of us on this phone tonight <laughs> describing what happened. Yes, uh, you were both there. Because it, uh, it is very difficult to believe. If you would permit me, I would like to play about a 77-second cut Absolutely. of the first report we got. This first came in on the... Actually, this is a brief conversation I had with a gentleman. This came in on the 1st of March, just about three or four days after the event after it had been preliminarily investigated by some of the people who were involved. But this, me, is, this is what put you onto it? This is the conversation I had a week ago, actually, that first put us on it, and Bob and I were on the road at about 9.30 the next morning, Friday morning, All right. just a week ago, headed to the site. But let me play this cut. It's about 70 seconds long. Okay, here we go. go. go ahead. I was told was the, the crew was out planting trees, uh, about noon, they looked up and saw what they thought it was a parachute coming down. But as they got closer to the ground, it stopped and started doing some maneuvering, uh, which got the attention of more of the crew members, and they were standing there within 500 yards. Of, uh, they noticed it was a uh, machine rather than a parachute after a little bit. It went over, there was a herd of elk in the turret next to them, and it went over hovered above the elk and actually picked one of them up mm -hmm. and took it, I'm assuming, into the machine. They said that it then uh, acted like the weight of that thing was almost too much metal. Mm -hmm. And it started wobbling, trying to gain altitude. It was moving over towards the edge of the clear cut, and they thought it was going to crash into the trees, but it stopped, moved back over into the middle of the clear cut, hovered for a minute and went out of sight vertical. And it took the elk with it, did it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when did this occur, please? Do you happen to know? Uh, the exact date, I don't. It was, I believe, Thursday. All right, so that started you out. Uh, I can see how that would get you going, all right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, holy uh, smoke. Uh, I at first didn't believe it. Yeah, I hear you. But it was coming from people with whom we've met now, and they're as sober-minded a group of people as you'll meet. Well, let's talk about who they are. Um, Bob, who are these witnesses? Uh, Fourteen people seeing this. That's pretty impressive. Now, who, what kind of witnesses are we talking about here? Well, we're talking about the people that were scared. Scared by this event as much as the elk herd was scared. Apparently, they were both huddling after the event. Not together, but in, in separate groups. The impression I got was that they didn't want to jeopardize their, their job yeah. by talking about it. Uh, they then how did you get them to talk? They were willing to talk to us in uh, a special fashion, I will say. These people really, really do not want any publicity, and that is sort of an interesting aspect. That. From my vantage point, and I think Bob would probably agree, that is a very good sign. These people do not have an, any kind of agenda they apparently are trying to fulfill. They would not even allow us to photograph them. Mm. And there are certain aspects of our interview that we probably should just gloss over here and not mention at all. But uh, they took a day off. It was their day off when we interviewed them, and they assembled and drove some distance to meet with us to share with us firsthand what it was that they allegedly had seen just about uh, eight days earlier. 
And uh, it was interesting to watch them interact with one another. We, we interviewed them together for a host of reasons. Generally, you like to interview people separately. We did it together for a host of reasons. Mm -hmm. And it was very interesting to see how each of them amplified what the other one would say. Were, but, you, were you taping? We did tape, yes. Yes, we did. You did tape. But obviously, we, for, for obvious reasons, we can't put that on the air. Right. Yep. They now, don't want we to do look for certain signs and, and things that we, we know are common, but most witnesses don't know about. And one of them was just that the craft wobbled. It wobbled before. It picked the creature up. It wobbled afterwards. And it, and it wobbled in a, an interesting fashion. It uh, oscillated around all points of the compass, like a, a wave motion traveling around the circumference, which is uh, typical of reports that we get uh, with a video, for instance. It's a very strange and peculiar type of movement. All right, question. Uh, you remember the video, the now famous or infamous, I'm not sure which it is, Mexico City video of the wobbling UFO that goes behind the buildings? Right. Yeah. Like that? Yeah. Apparently so. Uh, it was wobbling slowly as it approached the elk, according to the witnesses. And as you heard this gentleman uh, just comment in this uh, tape I just played, after it picked the animal up, it was almost as if it was overgrossed, as though it had too much weight, and it started wobbling in a much more pronounced fashion. And what people described to us, I found to be very reminiscent of that, that uh, tape from Mexico City called the Las Lamitas tape. Uh, Jaime Massan, who I know has been a guest on your program, described it and described his new evidence in that case, and it's, it's rather convincing. Well, certainly the interview with a little girl who saw it independent of any tape or any knowledge, that was extremely convincing, yes, despite it was. the best bunking efforts of the, of the confirmation program. Mm -hmm. um, so the two of you, I mean, uh, 14 witnesses, that's, that's really incredible. Uh, you might get a couple of people, m maybe even three, to concoct a story, but not I don't think 14, and uh, particularly under the conditions of we don't want anything, we really don't want to talk to you, and we certainly don't want our pictures taken, and you don't have permission to play the tape. Yeah. 14 witnesses is pretty good, Art. And uh, Anybody have any idea what they might want with an elk? Well, of course, there are all the mutilation cases. And we had heard that there was, and we did examine a dead elk that was not too far, maybe 20 minutes from the site. Uh -huh. However, there were no uh, marks at all. It looked like a healthy uh, but dead elk. Yeah. It was a very mysterious situation. If I can jump in there, Bob. Yeah, go ahead, Bob, Bob examined it more than I did, although we were standing, I mean, just two feet from this animal. A very healthy, well-fed pregnant female elk, uh, no broken bones, no bullet wound. We rolled her over with another gentleman who is very experienced in these matters. We could find no overt sign of injury, bullet hole, or anything. Hmm. And it, it is common for wild animals to die, of course. Uh, is it your hypothesis, gentlemen, that you examined possibly the elk that was, had been taken up? Well, we don't know that. I, I understand. I'm just asking if that... If, it's one of the possibilities. The other possibility, uh, other than natural death, or would be that perhaps radiation uh, from the craft could have affected another elk that was nearby. This wasn't the only dead elk found. There was another one, a yearling, which we didn't get a chance to examine at another spot. So did, I, did, either, did either one of you come away from the, the interview of these three with any doubts about the story? No doubts. No doubts. No doubt worth mentioning in my case either. These people are sincere, intelligent, eloquent people who were unsettled by what they allegedly had seen. They had no particular desire. We had to round them up. It took some effort to get them rounded up over the course of the day to meet with us. They're responsible enough individuals that they recognize the value of this information. They did meet with us. Uh, it was a very matter-of-fact, factual uh, interview. Yeah.
And again, again, the the craft itself was barely larger than the elk. Is that so? So it wasn't that big. No. God. One of the things that uh, they commented on. This is a very interesting point. Maybe you can amplify on this too, Bob. They commented that the object was not much larger in diameter, and it was dis disc shaped. Clearly disc shaped is the impression I got from them. It was not much bigger than the elk it said it, it, it itself, as Bob has mentioned. But when it picked up the elk, their impression was that the object increased in its dimension. It got bigger. Oh my! Yeah. It 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 morphed or it it grew literally to accommodate the the bulk or the size of the elk. We can't guarantee that there could have been optical illusion. There are a lot of things involved in this case. Speaking for my own part, speaking for the National UFO Reporting Center and Peter Davenport, I do not speak for MUFON. Bob uh, would have that privilege. <laughs> but I find this case to be alarming. It is a landmark case. Regrettably, we do not have a photograph. We do not have anything that I would construe to be hard proof. Well, 14 witnesses is pretty good for me. Yes. Bob, um, how would you classify this case in the cases that you have investigated in Washington? Well, I've never come across an elk abduction before. And mutilations are fairly rare. I've had some mostly on the eastern side of the mountains involving cattle. And of course, just north of us in BC, there was a rash of cat mutilations. Um, this elk apparently was actually seen by these witnesses to be in midair below the craft and, and then slowly rising to it? Yes, it, when the craft approached the herd, the herd scattered up the hill to the east. Right. One of the elk separated from the herd and that's the one that the UFO grabbed. Now once it had the elk, they, the witnesses couldn't see the elk kicking or any movement other than a slow rotation of the elk underneath the craft. A rotation? It, yeah. It, it, was sort of, it was sort of frozen, but turning slowly? Yes, yes. Uh. And then also, it seemed to be disappearing up into the hull, though there wasn't any opening that was described. Uh. That, was, that was an interesting part of their, their testimony or their statement. They, they were looking down. We estimate about 280 feet vertical, uh, elevation difference between the observers and the UFO that was below them. So they were looking at the top of the object when it was going after the elk. Oh, now that too is really different. Wow. Yeah. All right, gentlemen, hold on. We'll be right back. We're at the bottom of the hour. Can All right, this is a major incident we are discussing uh, with 14 witnesses of truly non trivial matter. The abduction, apparent abduction of an elk in a craft. Uh, seen by 14 witnesses. And, gentlemen, a couple of more questions. You said that the witnesses were looking down, so they actually saw the top of the craft. They saw all this from above. That's unusual by itself. How far away about from the, the craft when it, um, it got to the elk were the witnesses? How far away? Why don't you take that, Bob? Well, we got an estimate of about uh, 350 to 400 yards. Okay. So it's a distance, and... You can't see detail at that distance. Three or four football fields. Uh, one interesting point, uh, the reason the craft made a 360 circle, we think, is because the elk wasn't completely inside when it hit the tree line. We think that they, uh, the witness, some of the witnesses think that the elk may have hit the top of the trees, and then the, the craft wobbled a bunch and did backed up basically and did a 360 spiral to clear the trees before it went vertical. <sighs> and then once it went vertical, it took off at great speed? or No, no, it was fairly slow throughout. It, it never hovered. It basically maintained a steady speed and eventually disappeared in the cloud cover. It just <sighs> rose and rose and rose along the eastern or western facing slope and then it got steeper and steeper and just went out of their sight, disappeared into the sky to the northeast. That's what they reported to us. It is an astonishing story, in my opinion, Art. 
Well, and any time you have 14 people uh, who saw the same thing, you've got to stop and, and think real hard about it. And, and so this, you know, calls to mind a million questions. Uh, why such a small craft? Why an elk? What would they do with an elk? Who are they? Was it a, a guided craft? Was it a robotic craft? Sounds like it might have been a robotic craft, but who the hell knows? Uh, yeah, it's uh, very difficult to answer those questions. We, Bob and I, I think are frustrated uh, immensely by this case because we can't, we don't have a photograph. If we had a photograph of this one, I think it would change the complexion of ufology dramatically. But these guys were out there planting trees. They didn't think that they would see something like that. They didn't have a camera. Uh, one of the things that they reported to us is very interesting. They noted that the, as Bob reported earlier, the herd of elk after this incident regrouped in the same area and stayed very close to one another. Noticeably closer, they reported, and they were able to compare because they had been watching the animals throughout that morning down in the valley below them. Okay, isn't that the behavior um, of, a, of a group of elk or a herd of elk? Uh, wouldn't it be similar if a predator had taken one? Wouldn't the elk uh, then sort of gather closer for protection of the unit? I believe so. Yeah. I'm not a large animal biologist. It's very difficult for me to say, but that seems reasonable. Of course it does. Uh, interestingly, the workers themselves stayed very close to one another throughout that day. <laughs> they clearly, clearly were unsettled by this incident and uh, apparently talked about it profusely among themselves, and they were even put in touch with people with more authority in that area we don't want to identify them uh and describe their story to we don't want to get them we don't want to get them fired is what it comes exactly. down to they don't want to be identified none of the people involved in this case wish to be identified bob how long have you been an investigator for mufon about seven years seven years well anything either one of you want to add to this one uh, that we haven't covered well, hopefully we can uncover some something else. Uh, we are planning on talking to some more witnesses if that's possible. Yeah. One thing I might add, Art, um, <clears throat> when we were examining this dead female elk, we actually examined the dead elk before we went to the site of the alleged incident. Uh, we uh -huh. noticed, I noticed that this animal had ticks on it. When you when you uh, ran your hand through the fur of the animal. It had dead ticks on its neck. Dead ticks? Dead ticks. Now, my experience with ticks is that when an animal dies and starts getting cool, the ticks generally will leave the animal. Uh, these, these ticks appeared to be still uh, clinging to the animal. Oh, the animal was first seen on the 1st of March, Monday morning. And the ticks were dead? The ticks were dead. Now, again, I'm not an animal person, and, I, and you're not either, but I wonder if that's normal. Yeah. we. One of the things I'd like to do is talk to an entomologist and a uh, large animal biologist to find out if anything is known about the migration of ticks after an animal has died. But there was no mark on this animal. It makes me wonder whether the ticks and the animal might have been killed by the same uh, cause, let's call it. But uh, it is a very interesting case. We also noted that there weren't any scavengers that had uh, attacked the carcass. Yeah, that's right. Um, and, in fact, the people who went out with us, or the person who went out with us, is very experienced with these animals, and he noted that as well. It seems hmm. unusual that this animal would lie for at least five days, maybe more like nine days. I'd say impossible. Yeah. I, I, I live here in Pahrump, Nevada, and, uh, you know, there's a gazillion rabbits. And when a rabbit is hit by a car, it is, you can't count 24 hours before all signs of that rabbit, save a little discoloration on the road, are gone. The birds pick it apart inside of 24 hours without fail. Yeah. And that's, that's how it works here. Now, um, it's absolutely unreasonable that anything after eight or nine days would not have been... Yeah. We did run across a porcupine, too, as we were driving back from this carcass, and the porcupine had been picked clean. Its ribs were sticking out, but that animal was totally, totally untouched by any kind of predator, birds or uh, any kind of scavenger. Mm. You know, I, no I, I, I realize that both of you are investigators, but would either one of you 
like to conjecture anything about this? Or does that is that asking too much of an investigator? Yeah. Well, for me, it's asking too much because uh, there's just too many unknowns. Well, I guess we'll leave it to everybody in the audience to conjecture then. Yeah. I'm hard put to go any further than we've gone because we, we've we just run headlong into the barrier of the information we have. Uh, we don't have any more. We don't have any proof. All we have is uh, statements from individuals, although, again, very seemingly very reliable individuals. The only other thing I can add, Art, is that we have... I, I have never seen this volume of UFO reports as what I've seen in the last couple of months and even recently and there's been a cluster of reports just in the last two weeks I would say from all over the country in fact we had a major sighting out in the Midwest tonight I gather we have some listeners out in the Chicago area major sighting in Lamont uh, Illinois tonight and minutes later the object apparently was seen down in Susque Sandusky, Ohio area. Ohio. Uh, but, well listen, at this point I think we'll say thank you to Bob. Bob, thank you so much for coming on tonight. I understand uh, how Peter feels coming on the air with a story like this without some support would be a very uncomfortable thing to do. Well thank you, Art. And so thank you for coming on and, and take care. Alright. Alright, that's... Uh, uh, that's Bob, and he's a uh, uh, investigator for MUFON, and has been so for about seven years. Boy, that was some story. All right, now Chicago. Yeah. What What the hell has happened in Chicago? You know, I was just sitting here preparing for this program tonight, minding my own business, hoping the phone would be quiet, and it was not. Art, um, we have had what appears to be based on preliminary data, just about two two and a half hours ago a huge triangle was seen in the vicinity of Lamont, Illinois. Where is that from Chicago? I have not been able to find it on a map yet. I didn't okay. have time to do it, but it is a rural area. Somebody uh, please email me and tell me where Lamont is. I'll have that answer for you in a moment. I presume it's out to the west because if you go east from Chicago, of course, it's not rural area at all. But let me, if you'd permit me, what I would like to do to kick it off is just play about a 50-second audio cut that I took just this evening about a sighting out there at 10.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. The first cut I would like to play is a young gal, age 16, uh, who was out driving, and I'll let her describe what she saw. It was very dramatic, and after that we... Uh, we might play a cut from the mother who saw the same object. She was called out by her daughter. But here's a 50-second cut of what a young woman saw in Lamont, Illinois, tonight, just about two hours ago. Here we are. All right. And it wasn't moving. It was just sitting there in the sky. And I was driving towards it. And I went to make a turn, and it was coming closer. And then it was right above me, and it was triangular-shaped, and it had lights on, like, on the end of the, like, the wings of it. Mm-hmm. And it was going really slow. Okay. And really low, too. How long did you witness it, do you estimate? And what time did you see it, please? It was around 10.30 p.m. Okay. And what direction was it going? Could you estimate that? It was going east. It was going east, huh? Yeah. Okay. And then later when we saw it, it was going south. It, like, turned. Okay. So I came in the house, and I said, Mom, you got to come out here. There's something in the sky. Mm-hmm. Okay. Boy. So that girl tonight, Art, we're talking about an event less than two hours ago, not far from Chicago, saw a huge triangle overhead. And we didn't know what to make of that until we got a call from the Sandusky, uh, Ohio Sheriff's Office. Sheriff's Office. Reporting a sighting down there. But before we go to that sighting in Ohio that occurred just a few minutes after the sighting up in Illinois... If you'd permit me, let me play about a 70-second cut with regard to what this young woman's mother had to... All right, Peter, just it. before you do that, Lamont is approximately 40 miles southwest of Chicago. Okay, I'm glad to know. Um, interestingly, this young gal described that when they sat, last saw the object tonight, it was going to the east, and it made a turn, and it was going to the south. I presume those are approximate directions. But let's listen to what the mother had to describe. Her daughter came in, called her out, and said, Mom, you got to look at this. 
let's listen to what the mother has to report. All right. Here we are, about 70-second cut. Sure. I saw it was triangular-shaped, but it was not flying very high. Mm-hmm. But I think higher by the time I saw it than one said. And it seemed to be flying as though it was going... Okay. Where the point was, of yep. the probably around uh, 1035, there were um, lights all around it. There was mm-hmm. one light in the center underneath. Mm-hmm. And I can't remember if it was red or red. It was red. I couldn't remember if it was blue. There were blue lights on the sides. There was some white lights. See, it just had a ton of lights around it. Mm-hmm. Have you ever- Flying airplane sound at all and even when there's planes going really high overhead because we are a rural suburb and it's dark you will hear it mm-hmm. at night mm-hmm. there was no sound we were out there listening to critters yeah it was so silent as this object passed over them they could hear the critters she says that sounds just like more exciting <laughs> yeah exciting and exactly like it Come, what, have, what is going on peter yeah I wish I knew, Art. Um, I'm not able to say any more than the average person on the city streets what all of this means. But uh, I am in a privileged position, of course, to be able to have an oversight of the country and what's going on. And my impression is that these sightings are becoming more overt. These things are showing themselves much more brazenly than has been the case in the past. And it's happening much more frequently. You recall um, the uh, the sighting that Roger Lear and I reported on the 2nd of March uh, that we had had in Laughlin on the 27th of uh, February. I've got a little news for you on that one. I got a lot of emails, follow-up emails to that. It was seen in Arizona. Yes. Uh, that same night, Peter, the same uh, thing you saw was seen in Arizona widely. Yep. I'm not surprised. Uh, There was a similar sighting in Pomona, California that morning over a golf course. They had 30 people standing looking at a cigar over a golf course in Pomona, California on Saturday morning. You mean a cigar-shaped object? Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. Thank you. A cigar-shaped object. uh, (laughs) Terminology of my business. I sometimes lose track of it. A cigar-shaped object, metallic in appearance. They had long enough to go get a set of binoculars, come back and watch it. There were sightings all over this country that, uh, that morning, that afternoon, and that evening. But before we leave this sighting tonight, may I play one more cut, an audio cut of about 50 seconds duration of what was reported to us shortly after the report you just heard came in. Sure. This is from a young gal who was out driving with a young friend of hers, a male friend, they saw the object coming from the west or the northwest, which is exactly where it would have been coming from after Chicago, and this is just a few minutes after the Chicago sighting. Here we go. This is uh, Sandusky, Ohio. First we seen a really bright light, and we followed it. We went up, we got up to 85 miles per hour, got up right underneath it, and it was up in the sky. And we thought it was a big, bright star. And we're like, no, that is not a star. That's huge. So we got up right underneath it, and it was like a pyramid with three circular lights. And we got underneath it, and it was there for about a good few minutes, and it shot up into the sky. Like, you, you see a... a a shooting star fall down. It was like a shooting star going up into the... Uh-huh. I mean, it was crazy. And what time did you see it, and where were you located in Ohio at the time, please? I was at 101 and 268, like, in, combing into Clyde. I was probably, what, five minutes? We even shut off the car, and, like, you know, he got out, and I, like, just watched it. It was, like, freaky. Hmm. It was, like, just... It, you know, we knew it wasn't a plane, and it was, like, flying in the sky, and we got underneath it. It wasn't a plane, and it was... That was tonight. Wow. You know, she said pyramid, but a pyramid is nothing but a triangle, really. Yeah. I don't know whether that was an exact description. Uh, In both these cases, the observers were emotionally involved, let's say. Oh, you could clearly hear it in her voice. Sure. These young gals were still up. Even though they have school or work tomorrow morning, they were still up because they couldn't go to sleep. Both of them commented on that. Oh, yes, it does that to you. Yeah. It does that to you. And, you know, a strange... When you have a sighting like that, Peter, actually when it's occurring, you're kind of in what I would describe as a state of shock, and then you slowly come out of it 
and then you start talking about it, sort of reassuring each other about what you just saw. Yeah. But there's a kind of a state of shock that you're in for a while, and then comes the lack of sleep. Then you begin to think about what just happened to you. But when it's actually happening, you're, you're almost suspended. Yes. What you're describing, Art, is something that I have heard over the hotline here in Seattle hundreds of times. Hundreds of times. And uh, it has that effect on people. You're exactly right. But these sightings have been occurring all over the United States regularly, um, night and day. In fact, I have another very interesting cut here if we get about two minutes after the break. Oh, we have plenty of time. Um, I will play about a two-minute cut. I presume you may have a few listeners in Los Angeles. Am I correct in that assumption? One or two at least. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they may want to stay tuned because I'm going to play about a two-minute audio cut of what allegedly occurred very close to Los Angeles proper this past Sunday at about 5.20 in the morning below solid overcast. You know, one thing we're always interested in is... Mr. Davenport, and just before we launch into what happened in L.A., Peter... Um... On the phone, you and I were talking, mm -hmm. and you said something about our government. You want to repeat that? Well, I'm not sure I do, Art, but <laughs> I will. Um, I, you know, if it's something you really feel, you should say it. I'm, yeah. Because um, I agree with it. I, I'm alarmed by this government. Um, I think it's important for our listeners to know just how modest an operation this is up in Seattle. A lot of people mistake us for a Fortune 300 company, but yeah. we're not. <laughs> We're about one or two, maybe three dedicated people with a couple telephone lines, an antiquated tape recorder, and a computer. And we can generate some pretty good data just with that equipment. If we can do that, I ask rhetorically, what must the U.S. government be doing in spending 300 billions of our dollars every year for defense? Obviously, they are detecting UFOs, and therefore, they are lying to the American people. It is that simple, and that concerns me. It they concerns me, too. Uh, it is a straight-out, bold-face, absolute lie. I mean, that's the, all it is. It's all it can be, Peter. It is the biggest lie on the planet today. The fact that these governments would have us believe, Art, that this phenomenon that you and I have been talking about now for an, an hour and a quarter tonight and in fact for four years is not taking place. Now, it is alarming to me because this government we have purportedly, allegedly, is representative of our interests. Why are they saying nothing? Because perhaps they feel it is in our interest not to know. Now, just go back no further, if you will, than the Roswell press conference. Roswell case closed. Remember that one? Yeah. It was that all was due to crash dummies. Absolutely ludicrous. And, and you have to wonder why they even... In fact, why they, how they decided. I, I would love to know the people who sat around the table and decided they were going to have a press conference about Roswell to debunk the whole thing. Yeah. And wouldn't you love to know, I mean, there, there, there's got to be a paperwork trail a mile long about that thing. Yeah, of course. I don't know much about Roswell. I find some of these cases that we talk about routinely to be even more gripping, more alarming than Roswell. Let's face it, Roswell was over half a century The ago. one you just brought us uh, comes to mind. Fourteen witnesses. Yeah. But I mean... Peter, trust me, I was in the Air Force, and nothing would uh, high-profile public like that would happen in a million years without a whole bunch of people sitting around, um, high-profile type general class officers and civilians of some sort, deciding exactly what was going to be done. It's yeah. a lie. Yeah. I used to be an Air Force brat for one year. I got a good dose of the U.S. Air Force as a kid, 14 years of age, yeah. living in East Africa, Ethiopia. I was a family friend and guest of a family that was assigned duty there. And I got, uh, I became quite familiar with how things are done in the military, and then I served four years myself. Um, well, I sure would like to have somebody out there, Peter Gersten, are you listening, uh, serve up a Freedom of Information request with regard to the planning of that whole Roswell press conference. Yeah. Anyway, Los Angeles. Yeah. Let's go to Los Angeles. 
and I hope we have a few listeners down there tonight, mm -hmm. because just four days ago there was a, apparently, we have only one source on this, but apparently a very dramatic event. It was not a missile launch for reasons that will become evident to our listeners here very shortly. And this was a L former LAPD officer who witnessed what you're about to hear. It's about a 2 minute and 50, 15 second cut, Art. It's a little bit longer than I like to play. No, that's right. But it gets interesting towards the end. Here we go. It's actually in La Mirada, which I think is about 15 miles east of Los Angeles. All right. This is Sunday, the 7th of March, just four days ago. Here we go. On the 7th of March at 5.20 in the morning in suburban Los Angeles, my husband was leaving. He's a police motor officer to go to work. Uh -huh. Under heavy cloud cover, he was standing in the driveway. He called me up to see if we were wondering if it was going to rain. Under the clouds was this large, yellow, round-shaped something. At first, we thought it might be a planet, realized it was under the black cloud flat cloud cover. Mm -hmm. We then and, and got a, the binoculars came out. As I came out, he said, look, a smaller portion pulled away or broke off and at a measured pace took off in a south erection mm -hmm. and disappeared into the clouds. Mm -hmm. After that disappeared, the larger, and by this time I was looking through the binoculars, it was not as solid yellow or light as it would be with a star or, or a, mm -hmm. a, a planet. Light and dark, light and dark, light and dark. And it then took off at also a measured pace and went in a northeasterly direction. We thought it might be something going to Edwards Air Force Base. There has been nothing in any of the papers you know, or on TV. Frequently things like that are, are called into TV stations and they may yeah. mention it on air. Yeah. Well, with me. This has really sort of bugged me. I, what is this? And, and we have always thought, well, we don't disbelieve, we don't believe, we just have opened. And when we saw this, the more we talked about it, why we thought... This is something unusual, and it has to be a, it's not a natural, yes. if it were, it would not show through the cloud cover, it was under the cloud cover. Yep, so it couldn't be shown through the cloud, there were no stars, no anything else showing, okay. and it disappeared into the clouds, that was the other thing. When it did go into the, uh, this northeasterly direction, it went away and then just slid into the clouds. How long do you estimate you watched it, please? Oh, it was three or four minutes because I had time to run in the house, get the knockers, come out, and it was still stationary. And as I was adjusting them, my husband said, look, and that's when the smaller object just sort of, and it, and I don't know how to explain it other than it seemed to come down to curve, turn, mm -hmm. whereas if something were naturally falling as a falling star, it would have just gone very quickly. This was at a measured pace. Uh -huh. So... A measured pace, <laughs> two objects, a large one, yeah. and according to this source, again, I wish to emphasize, Art, that it's a single source, but... Um, a credible source, former police officer. A credible source. Yes. This is the wife of the officer who's speaking. Oh, I see. I asked her at the end of our conversation whether she was professional, whether she... she uh, worked in a responsible job. She speaks very eloquently. Yes. Very precise with the language. You learn a lot about people sure. when you spend half your day on the telephone. You just, bet. Judging from their voices. She said she was. And this is a case in which the object went to the north and east after it had dropped a smaller object apparently out of the bottom of it, <laughs> which slowed and stopped, and then it started moving in a methodical fashion to the southeast. I have no idea what could explain such a thing. There's nothing from this planet, in my opinion, that could explain something like that. And this is 15 miles from downtown Los Angeles just four days ago. Now, the only thing that would really wrap this up is if you had a witness saying, they saw it too and it was a runny elk. Yeah. <laughs> you know about that elk the one thing that I find really upsetting I love animals I love wild animals in particular and it really troubles me if these animals are being tortured or if they are dying of fright it's a very unsettling thought to of course. me and there's not a thing we can do about it that I'm aware of and they do die of fright don't they yeah of course they do. Uh, it happens in the wild all the time. Uh, I understand. I'm not a specialist in these fields, but 
I can just imagine some kind of Independence Day barbecue just on the far side of the moon or something like that. But, uh, you know, I have read, I'm not a specialist in the field of animal mutilation, but there have been, and Linda Howe could really Linda certainly is. address this. I think I've heard her say something like 30 or 40,000 cases, documented cases of farm animals. I know that have been mutilated. I know. You should follow up by calling Linda yes. and playing this for her. Um, well, now you can't, there's nothing to play. I guess that we should get this segment um, to Linda so that she hears it, so she knows what's going on. I mean, this is really in her... Yeah. I'll get in touch with her and uh, let her know about this case. We wanted to make sure that it was real. We, we actually didn't believe it at first. Uh, we wanted to go down, talk to the people, see the place with our own eyes, look for evidence, and so on and so forth. But after our day of investigating this, I'm pretty well satisfied that this is a real case. Well, I told Linda that you had something going that was in her area, and she was chafing at the bit, but I wouldn't tell her about it because I, I didn't really exactly know all the details, and I was sort of sworn to silence until we put it on the air tonight. So I'll apologize to her. <laughs> I thought of her, and I didn't want to uh, didn't want to raise dust unless I had really something in hand. Hear you. Uh, anything else, Peter? Uh, there's all sorts of stuff going on. You know, uh, Roger Lear and I were on uh, the 2nd of March talking about our sighting in Laughlin, Nevada on the 27th of September, that Saturday night at the end of the UFO Congress. Um, apparently you've gotten some information about that, but just uh, yesterday we received a report from a gentleman who saw apparently those same objects, those mm -hmm. same five objects in the night sky. Many, many people saw those objects. Before. Yes. He was in... Um, Chloride, Arizona, uh -huh. which I estimate is about 20 miles, maybe to the northeast, uh, maybe east northeast of Laughlin. And we got the report. I read it with eager delight because it tended to confirm the sighting that 50 of us had had right on the western bank of the Colorado River. And I quickly wrote him back asking him how he had found us, uh, whether he had heard the broadcast on the 2nd of March. He said, he know, no, he didn't know about us hadn't heard the broadcast. Mm -hmm. um, the interesting thing about his report, Art, is he was 20 or 30 miles to the east of the observers right. that Roger and I were standing with in Laughlin, Nevada. And the objects were even to the east of him. Of him. All right, well, I had a whole raft. I should have talked to you about this. I had a whole raft of emails from people who saw these objects, Peter. Yeah. Not just on that night but on several consecutive nights at about the same time mm -hmm. yeah i'm not surprised art and what this uh this one report we got from chloride tells seems to tell me if in fact he was looking at the objects at the same time we in the group of 50 over in laughlin were looking at them what it tells me is that the objects that we could see must have been 20 or 30 miles away from us and they were quite prominent. They were not large, but they were prominent, which means that they were they must have been sizable. We're talking about something that must have been, I'm only guessing now, I have not worked this out, 30, 40, 50 meters in diameter and highly luminous for us to have been seen, to have been able to see them from 20 or 30 miles away. People frequently ask if UFOs uh, wish to visit Earth or be seen near Earth, why would they have luminosity? Why would they have lights? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> unless they want to be seen. Yeah. The, uh, this woman who just reported from La Mirada, she, she pointed out that there were alternating sections on this thing. Light, oh, dark, oh. light, dark, light, dark. I hear you. And we hear that all the time. In fact, it's reminiscent of a report from the 2nd of February that I think I played on an earlier program, an earlier program of Coast from uh, Sicklerville, New Jersey. It's about 15, 20 miles southeast of Philadelphia. That's exactly what the woman reported she allegedly had seen on the 2nd of February this year. So there's consistency between these reports. But, I mean, even, even our own government, our own Air Force, uh, we've got stealth um, fighters, we've got stealth bombers, we've got black helicopters, and if we don't want them seen at night, they don't get seen. Yeah. 
imagine a technology that might be thousands, millions, or billions of years older than ours. When we encounter it, it will probably look like magic to us. Mm-hmm. Sure magic. Uh, listen, the first mass mind experiment I did, I did about two years and two weeks ago. The first experiment I dared toy with in my reckless early days was to try and get millions of people to concentrate on craft showing themselves above a major U.S. city. That was the first mass experiment we did. Two weeks later, almost to this very day, we had incredible occurrences in Phoenix, Arizona. Yeah. I don't know what to make of that. That's certainly not my field. I know. It is clear. It is clear from my vantage point up here in Seattle that we're dealing with something that we do not understand. It is vastly beyond what, what grasp of technology we have on this planet. And I am prepared to give considerable, uh, lend considerable ear to any assertion in the field of ufology because the more we learn, the more confused we become. And it is clear that something is going on. The only, the only thing that seems clear is, as you suggested, uh, frankly, earlier, that this is the biggest lie in the world. Yeah. You know, going back to that issue for a moment, if I may, I see we're coming up on a break here shortly, but the thing that confuses me about the government issue and UFOs is how could our government continue the lie through generations of elected officials. I mean, presidents, members of Congress, uh, generations of people in the military. It's now been 50 years since the, over 50 years, almost 52 years now, since the so-called modern era of ufology began with Roswell, or with Ken Arnold, actually, over the state of Washington. All right. And that's a lot of people who have passed through fairly responsible positions in our government and yet all of them have remained silent with a few notable exceptions. Uh, Barry Goldwater pressed right. this. Uh, Governor Carter actually pressed it. You know, he made two, at least two promises that I'm aware of in the summer of 1976 when he was running for the office of president. He said he would never lie to the American people. And when he was asked about his written UFO report that he submitted to NICAP in 1973, he said were he elected to be elected president, he would square with the American people on UFOs. Well, I know, but I think that presidents get into office, they get elected, and then somebody sits them down and talks to them about reality. Yep. All right, Peter, hold on. We're at the bottom of the hour. When we come back, we're going to reminisce about two years ago and what happened. It was surely non-trivial. You'll hear the voices. We'll be right back. So I have one for Peter. Peter, are you there? I'm here. I'm going to read you one. All right. This just came in. Now, over the last several days, we have been having a rather large magnetic storm. The sun really is kicking up a, a hissy fit these days. And I just got this fax, which says, Art, pilots see spectacular northern lights display tonight. Check this out. Art, I'm a commercial airline pilot. While en route from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, to Minneapolis, Minnesota this evening at about 11.30 p.m., I was treated to a spectacular northern lights display in the northern sky. Now, that's not why I'm writing to you, because I've been treated to many shows in the past. Main reason I'm writing to you tonight is not what I saw, but what I physically felt. I noticed my face had the same feeling as when you lay in the sun getting a suntan on the beach. My skin on my face was very, very warm, almost like I had a fever. The captain stated that he was experiencing the same conditions as I. Once we descended below the overcast clouds over Minneapolis, our conditions disappeared. I have never, in my 15 years of flying, experienced anything like this. Signed, Paul, first officer for a major airline in the Midwest. Hmm. Pretty weird, huh? I don't know what to make of that. Uh, <clears throat> it brings to mind a, an incident that occurred on the 27th of February, 1996, 
in the vicinity of Saginaw, Michigan, twin-engine turboprop um, had a disc right on its nose. It attempted to dive away from it. The disc went all the way through the overcast with it. But I have no way of knowing whether what these gentlemen experienced uh, in any way UFO related, of course. But that is a very interesting story. Can sunstorms, solar storms do that, do you know? Uh, well, uh, Peter, I, I didn't think so. Um, now, I know that there are issues at altitude during geomagnetic storms. Mm -hmm. But I have never heard of anybody describing those kind of physical effects ever. And the captain, you know, I mean, here we have a captain and first officer both saying the same thing. So I, I, um, I, I don't know how to categorize this one, except I sure would like to talk to the fellow. That is truly bizarre. We would like very much to get a report from them over our website, the online report form allows a person just in five minutes to capture data like that, send it to us, and we'll post it. They won't jeopardize their job that way, Peter. Yeah. We don't release names, addresses, or phone numbers so they can keep it more or less anonymous. As although, anonymous as it was when I just read it? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> although if somebody wants to find out who they are, of course, they could go to the the uh, flight number and the time and so on and so forth yeah, and figure exactly. it out. Exactly. But um, And so, I, you know, I... I I, I absolutely believe, purity, um, what this fellow has said to me, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't jeopardize his job. I, I know a good friend of mine is John Lear, and he used to investigate this kind of thing, and it cost him a job with a major airline. I remember the story. Sure. Yeah. It's a true story. So they don't report these things, as we well know. Listen, two years ago, two years ago, it would have been about this hour, wouldn't it? It would have almost to the minute, Art, I think almost to the minute, is when we were on the air talking about what had just happened. In Phoenix. In Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, it's ironic. And, you know, this past week I've sent out uh, copies of a two-page press release that I prepared and circulated to wire services, to local newspapers here, local television stations, people all across the country, NPR, uh, sent out several dozen of these things, faxed them out, them out, and I have yet to have a single news organization or medium call back to get clarification, to seek more information, to acknowledge receipt. You know, I think these people in the press must think we're idiots or something. I do not understand why people in the press are not going after this story. This is the biggest story that we've had in 2,000 years. Yes, sir. And it is going uncovered save for one news outlet in the world, and that is Coast to Coast and uh, Dreamland. You know, you, <clears throat> you did the earliest coverage on the Phoenix Lights. I think you had it on within an hour. Yeah, as it was, was happening, it? actually. still happening. Yeah, exactly. We went on at 11 o'clock that night. I think you were starting your broadcast at 11 back Phones then. Phones were absolutely going berserk. Yeah. That was a, it was a night I'll never, ever forget. And, and you've got a couple of sound clips from back then, don't you? Yeah, we sure do. We can play a couple more here uh, tonight if you'd like. Sure. But, uh, yeah, that was a wild night for us. I It was one of those nights where you don't even believe what people are telling you. They're telling you that the object stopped over them, mm -hmm. and they had to hold their arms out in a V about 60 degrees out to touch the right hand and the left hand wingtips of uh, the object that was hovering motionless directly overhead them at an altitude. You know, we estimate, and you've probably heard this already, Art, we may have dis discussed this on a program in the past, the object, and we think there were several of them that night, two years ago, the object that stopped just south of Camelback Mountain in Phoenix was somewhere between one and three miles in width one and three miles, and it hovered there for an estimated four to five minutes. Now, remember, folks, Phoenix is not your hick little city. There are, in the Phoenix area, roughly two million people or better. This is a major U.S. metropolitan area, though it's in the desert. It's a gigantic area, I, I, just a major U.S. metropolitan area. Seventy-five miles wide, fifty miles from north to south. Right, not Podunk, uh, Nevada, or Wyoming, or whatever but a major U.S. population center. Yep. 
Let me play a little cut here, Art. Uh, it's just a short piece, about 30, 40 seconds maybe, but it comes from Prescott Valley, I believe is the one I'm going to play here. It has a family looking at this object that is going to the west of them and heading south. I think the gentleman actually cites the fact that they think it turned. Mm -hmm. But this is what was seen over Prescott Valley as it was coursing south to Phoenix within probably a minute of this broadcast or of this telephone conversation the object was uh, approaching Phoenix 30 or 40 miles to the south. But let me just play this and this will give our listeners who are not familiar with the Phoenix Lights an idea of what happened two years ago tonight. Here we go. Uh, well, I was outside with my wife and my two boys. Uh -huh. and, uh, we were looking to the almost west at about 820. Uh -huh. And there was a, it was like a diamond formation. Uh -huh. And uh, five red lights. Pretty good spread. And, uh -huh. uh, the very front craft had a white light, like a landing light. Uh -huh. So I went and got my binoculars to look at them, and they had solid lights, and they were moving very slow. Uh -huh. And uh, so I, I thought maybe at first it was helicopters, but then because I've seen them you know, do the dusting at night in L.A. and things like that, yeah. like they're moving as slow as that. And they came overhead. Um, they still had their solid red lights on. Each one, each there were five of them, and uh -huh. each one had a solid red light, except uh -huh. for the nose one, and didn't make a sound. Uh -huh. uh, and they came by very slow, and they stayed in perfect formation. Yeah. And they passed us, and they banked to the southeast, almost to sideways, and stayed in perfect formation. Uh huh. Mm. It, was, it was amazing. I think it may have been one object you were looking at. Well, I could see stars. Uh huh. You know, I have uh -huh. my binoculars out, and I have very powerful binoculars. Yeah. I couldn't make out any shapes. Uh huh. But I, I saw a star pass through at the formation. Yeah. Mm hmm. You know that is. That is approximately, I think Prescott Valley is at least 40 miles north of Phoenix. And there are still people to this day, even UFO investigators, who claim that this incident, 40 miles north of Phoenix, mm -hmm. was caused by flares that were released six, at least 62 miles to the southwest of Phoenix. I know. In other words, almost 100 miles between this gentleman's physical location and those alleged flares. They no, those, made... those would be some flares. Yeah. And in addition, let it be said as well, that this sighting took place, this gentleman sighted the time of 8.20 p.m., and the flares were not launched until at least an hour and ten minutes later, perhaps more like an hour and a half later. And there are still people who argue passionately, who argue, attempt to argue cogently, although that doesn't work, of course, that the whole thing was caused by flares. Mm. And uh, it is terribly alarming to me. You know, if the government can bury this one, if they can get away with this one, Art... They can bury anything. They can do anything. And that's the reason that it's imperative that we keep this, this subject before the American people. Well, I remember that the, uh, the city of Phoenix claimed that they had a few calls about it and now i can tell you right now that i had hundreds and hundreds of calls the phones were going totally crackers yeah and so then i think there was somebody else who reported just a few calls in phoenix um just totally unreasonable and then and we'll play a little mo one more i think you've got one more don't you yeah i do and then and then the strangest thing of all occurred after this massive sighting. There was dead silence. I mean, there was nothing in the press. There was nothing. Yeah. And three months went by. Three months went by. And then all of a sudden, on the same day, CNN, NBC, ABC, CBS, all of them broke this story like it had happened two hours ago. Yeah. At the same time. One slight exception, and it's noteworthy, and the young gal who wrote the only article that appeared, that I'm aware of, that appeared on the 14th of March, the day after, Laura from the Prescott Daily right. uh, Courier. No, but I'm talking about national. National news, there was nothing. In, uh, until three months later, and then it, it came all at once. Now, yeah. you can only puzzle about why. Yeah. Two weeks ago, one of the slides I showed during my presentation at the UFO Congress, and the bulk of my presentation was on the Phoenix case, is my telephone bill that clearly shows my calls to Luke Air Force Base that night, sure. a call or two to Pahrump, Nevada, 
and the next day, the 14th of March, calls all over the country to Philadelphia, to Los Angeles, and so on, and we couldn't give the data away. I think it's probably that people didn't believe it, or I don't know just what goes through the mind of somebody in the press. I, I am developing a theory, Art, that these people in the press are sitting too close to their monitors, <laughs> and the elect radiation. The radiation is <laughs> affecting radiation. the neocortex a bit, <laughs> and... Uh, <clears throat> In the case of uh, news anchors, I think it may be hairspray that is migrating through the cranium into uh, this, the neocortex. This is really going to help you get future things on the air, Peter. Uh, I'm keep sure going. of that. <laughs> it's finally beginning to break. There's been some very good coverage recently, but it's very sparse given the importance of this phenomenon. Let me play a little cut from uh, Phoenix. This is a um, a woman in Phoenix who is describing... Bear in mind the gentleman who just, uh, whose voice we just heard described the thing going to the southeast. This woman describes it, I think, coming from the northwest, if I recall. I'm going on memory now. But uh, the two reports link the uh, Prescott and Phoenix, and it, it gives us an almost an unbroken track of this object. Let's see what we have here. I'm not exactly sure myself, Art, but it's, I think it's about a 30-second cut. Let Let's see what we have here. Sure. Uh, about 10 minutes ago, uh, I saw in the northeastern sky over Phoenix uh, a formation of lights that gave the brilliance and size of stars. Uh -huh. However, it was in a formation of a triangle. With, there were five lights. Uh -huh. At the top point of the triangle, there were three lights, one at the tip and then one on either side. Uh -huh. There were two other lights on the bottom point of what would be a triangle shape. No I can't. And it was to the northeast of her. She was on the northeast corner of Phoenix looking northeast, and the flares were probably 70 or 80 miles behind her to the southwest. And newspapers, uh, people in the press, people in the Air Force are still arguing, still arguing passionately, Art, that the whole thing was caused by a bunch of flares dumped out by some Air Force A-10s yeah, on total, a bombing Total, run. total, total hogwash. Yeah. Um, hundreds and hundreds of calls. It was a major sighting above a major U.S. city, and it went dead for three months, and then all of a sudden, boom, there it was. Yep. So uh, you, you guys tell us, all right, look, we're going to wrap this up, but Peter, I want to do as I've done before, and your organization, haha, <laughs> not Fortune 500, um, is a very small organization with a computer, a couple phones, a couple of volunteers, and it operates on... Uh, Shoestring budget. Shoestring budget. I was going to say uh, fumes, you know, if, if you're in an airplane, you operate on fumes. So yeah. if people want to donate a couple of bucks, a few bucks to you to keep the phones running up there, um, where do they send it? Yeah, I'll give out the address. And let me just say, Art, that people have been very generous. It's making a big, big difference knowing that we don't have to dip into our own savings to pay the phone bill up here. But uh, let me give the address now. It's the National UFO Reporting Center, and it's P.O. Box 45623. The next line is University Station. That's the name of a post office, and it's Seattle, Washington, and the zip code is 98145. That address again is P.O. Box Four five six two three, University Station, Seattle, Washington, and the zip code is nine eight one four five. And let me say, if people have reports, Art, yes, we are being absolutely deluged with information up here. It's a torrent. And if they have sightings they would like to report, particularly if they're past sightings, we invite them. Please go to our website. There's an online report form. They can take five or ten minutes to record a sighting or an unusual event, send it to us. We don't have to take all the information over the telephone. That's a big help. And our website address is one of those very easy-to-remember ones. It's www.ufocenter.com. That's ufocenter.com. All right. And there is a phone number. If something is happening, breaking news right now, then there is a... Report it right now, number, right? There is indeed, and our telephone hotline in Seattle is area code 206 722 3000. 
That number again is area code 206-722-3000. All right. And uh, again, folks, if you can spare a few bucks, would they make a check out to the National UFO Reporting Center? If they would, please. Target donation, five or ten bucks is what we prefer, and it's a big help to us. All right. National UFO Reporting Center, P.O. Box 45623. That's P.O. Box 45623, University Station in Seattle, Washington, zip code 98145. Peter, thank you, as always. Thank you so much. Thank you. The peak of the flu season is striking late this year posing an unexpected health risk from influenza into March, a time when physicians and patients are lowering their guard against it. Peak influenza time is a dangerous time. Commonly during peak season, it is easy to assume all flu-like illnesses are flu. A clinical diagnosis for flu in the doctor's office without a definitive influenza test can allow a diagnosis of bacterial illness to be missed, which can result in unnecessary deaths. Influenza will likely continue this year into April because of the lateness of this particular season. So there you have it, and I echo what the person who sent the first fax is saying. Just about everybody I know has been stricken, in, if not once, possibly multiple times. Many of them beginning to turn into pneumonia, then you turn quickly to antibiotics, which are seemingly having uh, much less effect right now. So I just thought I'd drop that on you and let you all digest it for whatever it's worth or not worth. Visiting, revisiting a couple of earlier topics, listen to this one from uh, Joni in Arvada, Colorado. Art, I have a second-hand child incident. Several years ago, I was given this account by a friend. She was driving with her three-year-old niece. Her niece suddenly simply said, Auntie, do we have to keep doing this? My friend replied, Yes, honey, we have to keep driving until we get there. Her niece quickly responded, No, no, no. I mean dying and being born again and dying and being born again and dying and being born again. <laughs> or this. Art, when I was between the ages of three or four, I was in the car with my mother and sister when we just picked up from school. I was being my usual rambunctious self when mom asked me to pipe down. For the next couple of minutes, I was still, but then, according to my mother, I said something that came as a total surprise to both of them. While looking out the window, I calmly said, I wish I could go back to California to see my two sons. My mother and my sister looked at each other, then my sister looked back at me to see if I was just kidding around, which I was and still am apt to do. She told me that I was still looking out the window and looking wistful and sad. And when she turned to tell my mother that she should probably check on me, that's when I started to bounce around the back seat again. When asked about what I had just said, I had no recollection of it. Huh. But I'll tell you one thing, Art. I was born in Iowa and have always longed to move to California. I guess it shouldn't be any surprise to me. These are really interesting stories to me. Do you think it true that we come back again and again and again? The evidence would seem certainly to point that direction, wouldn't it? When you hear these stories, how does it make you feel? I have a special message from men about male potency and performance. Today, I'm going to be interviewing for Dreamland this Sunday, Dr. Charles Emmons, author of At the Threshold, UFOs, Science, and the New Age. And what this really is all about is actually what Peter was talking about a little while ago. The incredible number of obvious sightings that we're having and the government's reaction to them. It should be a very, very interesting program, and you can catch it on 
Broadcast.com. If you're here at 1 o'clock in the afternoon later today. Should be a very, very interesting program. You can even interact and call. And then, of course, the broadcast itself, commercial broadcast, will be on uh, Sunday. Now, next week, I'm not going to do Dreamland. Ramona is my wife. The show is going to be about the craft. Something Ramona knows a bit about. With Dr. Evelyn Paglini, somebody who knows a whole lot about the craft. And so my wife, she'll probably cringe. Something of a practitioner will interview Dr. Paglini, a professional practitioner. And I'm going to sit here and just listen. Do the spots, introduce Linda Howe, and then she will do the body of the show. First time ever, I think. That'll be the following week, um, a week from today, actually. So there you have it. If you're ready, we're going back to open lines. Anything you want to talk about in open lines is fair game. Anything at all. Here we go. First time caller line, you're on the air. Hi. Hi, Art. My name is Eric. I'm calling from San Luis Obispo, California, KGLW 1340. Yes, sir. That's the way to do a promo. <laughs> um, great show tonight with Peter. Um, something occurred to me. If there are, if we make the assumption that there are indeed big ships out there that are, you know, quarter mile, three miles big. Right. Uh, and that they are of terrestrial origin. Where would they store these things? Or would they have a permanent camouflage? They'd have to show up somewhere on the ground. Where would you store a mile-wide craft? Well, number one, I'm willing to believe that we have achieved perhaps even anti-gravitic technology or back-engineered it. You know, the area near where I live. But yeah. um, I'm not willing to believe that we have created a craft a mile in size. Although one might argue that if you have anti-gravitic technology, a craft a mile wide in size, or a mile in size, it might not be at all difficult. But where, as you point out, would you hide something of that size? Um, I, have no, I have no answer for you. Yeah. Well, I appreciate it. Okay, sir. I, uh, to that one, I have absolutely, uh, I have simply no answer. I have no idea where you, under the ocean? Maybe on the ocean floor? <laughs> Just a guess off the hip guess. Wild card line, you're on the air. Hi. Hello? Yes. Yes, you're on the air, sir. Art. Yes. Uh, this is Gerald. I'm from uh, Centerville, Tennessee. Yes, Gerald. And uh, That's the state where people marry their cars, or they drive. <laughs> yeah, or shoot them. <laughs> or shoot them. A, a man the other day shot his 90 times because it wouldn't run. He put he emptied three 30-round uh, clips of an AK-47 into it. Uh, yes, he did. There in Tennessee. And then, well, all the while, some other guy's trying to marry his car. Trying to marry his car. We don't know whether to shoot them or love them. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of like women in a lot of ways, actually. All right. I missed... Uh, uh, last week during the U UFO special on uh, the uh, Learning Channel, I believe it was. Yes, uh -huh. I came in at the end of in, Bra in Brazil. Uh, three girls were talking about seeing a alien, so they described it. Yes, sir. I am familiar with that sighting. What What happened? Can, can you please tell me? I had a number of UFO investigators whose names won't come to mind right now uh, who came back and related these interviews to me. But yes, oh yes, they saw not just a craft, but they saw the creatures from the craft, these little girls, and they gave identical accounts, uh, very specific accounts of what they saw, these creatures they saw. Now, again, <laughs> again, sir... How can there be this many extremely credible close encounters without our government uh, being aware of it? They are aware of it, is the answer, and therefore it is, as Peter said, the biggest lie ever told. That's, that, that's true. It, you know, in, in this case, you would hope that, that a government like, say, Brazil would not be like the, the U.S. government and cover it up. Well, uh, governments, sir, uh, excuse me, tend to be kind of the same. 
They really do. Whether uh, Whatever form of government they are, ours, parliamentary, even dictatorships, they all tend to be secretive. Secretive is the stuff of which governments are made. They are secretive. And uh, from that secrecy, they derive their power, or at least a portion of their power. That's where their power comes from, even our government. There is power in secrecy because you can move black budgets and money that people don't even know about all over the place, and that is a lot of power. Money is power. Secrecy is power. So governments tend to be the same no matter their makeup. East of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hi. Well, hi, Art. Hi. I'm afraid I may have this uh, <laughs> bacteriological flu that's going around here. Um, uh, how long have you had it? Well, I've had it about a week. I've known others around here. Seems like every third or fourth person has picked this thing up. Yes, I'm very uh, The very only thing aware. I hear that uh, seems to knock it loose is colloidal silver or what they're calling oxygen therapy. Uh, one thing I wanted to pass out to people, there's an awful lot of talk here lately about uh, Russians possibly preparing for a first strike. And I just thought I'd share with people that uh, there has been a warning by a group, Prophecy Club, that says that when there's internal fighting here, uh, sort of an internal revolution, like when Ed Danes indicated they may be coming for our guns, that that's the time that they're going to take advantage of and do the first strike. So if people want to check that out, they are on the web by that name. So I think it'd be a good idea since things are getting kind of weird. You you do know about the military down in Andrews and oh, yes. pre-positioning in the 10 FEMA regions. And here in the Bloomington, Indiana area, Art, we're getting FEMA public service ads like you just wouldn't believe. National well, Guard ads of what, like of, what, believe. of what sort? Uh, what is FEMA... Like what kind of ads? Well, they're they're feely good self promotional ads. They're talking about tornadoes, having a few days worth of food, basically trying to make themselves look good. Uh, <clears throat> there is a publication called The Spotlight that in 1992 produced a paper called FEMA versus Your Constitutional Rights. Yeah, I know, but they're kind of a right wing nut type publication. Well, I happen to think that they've been telling the truth a lot more than the left wing nuts out there, like Communist News Network and the others. Uh, they do show the executive orders in that publication, which are on the uh, government's federal register, right in the uh, uh, whitehouse.gov website, and they've been incrementally moving toward FEMA as the secret government quite some time now. But I, so who's, I, I, who's been I, telling I, us the truth? I honestly believe uh, that both are equal uh, misrepresentations. Both. In other words, I have never given what I read in the spotlight much credence. Now, that doesn't mean that occasionally the spotlight doesn't get something right. Uh, but then your obvious bias uh, was shown when you call it the Communist News Network. It's CNN. And I don't think of CNN as a Communist News Network. I think of CNN, for the most part, as one of the better news outlets in the country. Maybe not as good as I um, considered them to be at the beginning when they first began broadcasting, but still really excellent. So I don't think CNN is communist, and I don't think that the spotlight is particularly a publication that I would gravitate to. I don't think either one of those things is true, personally. East of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hi. Uh, hello. Uh, this Art? Yes, sir. Uh, this is Marty out here in Tennessee. Another Tennessee. Two Tennessee calls in a row. Hey, Marty, yeah. you turn your radio off, please. Yeah, okay, it is off. All right. Uh, what I was wanting to ask it is in uh, Majestic 12 files. Yes. Uh, there's a one upside down on that one and a backwards beat. There's a what now? The date on the November the 12th. Yes. The one is upside down. Okay. And it's got a backwards B. Which means to you what? Uh, is that document been messed with or? Oh, now how would I know? Okay. And I, well, one other thing I wanted to ask you is on the date where it was addressed to Kennedy. Yes. And Kennedy, that's awful. That's awful close to his assassination date. Uh huh. Well, I imagine there were a lot of things addressed to the president close to his assassination date. Well, yeah. Well, you know, I was. I just want to, I'm, I'm a skeptic like you. I kind of pretty much, I read stuff several times before I believe what I see or read. Yeah, good for you. But uh, I just thought, you know, I might be able to answer some of that, but 
I figured that was a pretty far fetch. Uh, I appreciate your call, sir, and I will um, I'll check out what you just mentioned with respect to the documents. West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Good morning. Good morning, Art. How are you? Okay. This is Tim in California. Yes, Tim. And there's a couple things I'd like to say. Uh, you have some excellent guests, and you have an excellent show. Okay, there's some things that uh, I'd like to let our audiences know. Spit them out. Okay. For one thing, the reason that we have physical life is to grow our spirits. And it's interesting that there's not one person on the planet that's going to take one cent with them when they die. And it just blows my mind that people are so focused on that inwardness when there's the other end of the spectrum of the outwardness. Considering you look in the Egyptian pyramids of the drawings are showing the thousands of people with stars above their head, those are people that emit their energies. You know, they're focusing their lives in the... Uh... Well, you know what? I'm fed up with the whole thing, and I think that we should work on being able to take some of it with us when we go. Uh, well, take our spirit with us, absolutely. No, 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 no. I'm talking about CDs, uh, investments of various sorts, money. Yeah, memories. Uh, yes, I want to be able to take cars... Cars, women. There, there are a number of things that I uh, rather feature I want to take with me, and I'm fed up with being told that I can't do it. Well, I mean, there really isn't anyone that's going to take physical things with them. I mean, we're only going to take spiritual things with us, our learning experiences, you know. But our... that's such a, 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 a limited view you're taking there. I, I mean, I want my car with me when I go. Well, of, of course, you know. Well, that's... so there's got to be a way that this can be worked out. Listen, I, I've, I've got to run. We're at the bottom of the hour. I appreciate your call. I mean, everybody's always saying, I can't take it with you, can't take it with you, can't take it with you. Well, I'm fed up with that, and I want to take some of it, at least, with me. Got to be a way to do that. Maybe one CD and my car. I really want my car. Oh, yeah, my wife, too. Eight hundred eight two five five zero three three. West of the Rockies, including Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, and New Mexico, at one eight hundred six one eight eight two five five. First time callers may recharge at area code seven zero two seven two seven twelve twenty two, and you may fax art at area code seven zero two seven two seven eight four nine nine. Please limit your faxes to one or two pages. This is Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell. Now again. And here's our Once again, here I am. Top of the morning, everybody. That was then. Or all we had to worry about was our car and maybe the gal. And today we have a lot more. We're coming up on Y2K rather quickly now, aren't we? And even conservative organizations are recommending that you store some food. At the very least, that you have food for... They say a few days. I think they're being rather optimistic. But we'll see. If you want quality stored food, real stored food, stored food that will have a, a shelf life of about a decade, be ready for you any time during that decade. And remember with stored food, if nothing happens, cool. Eat your investment. You know, because it's actually good. I would like to recommend the J. Michael Stevens Group. And they have been in the stored business a lot longer than Y2K has been looming publicly. They're in Salt Lake City. That should tell you something about them. They use containers that don't leak. Of that, you can be sure. They use food that is not foreign sourced and possibly contaminated. They are an extremely reputable company that cares about people. They really care about people. Do you follow me? That's an honest evaluation of this company. If you call them, they will send you free information and you can sit there and ponder what you wish to do. But it's something you ought to be... Oh, and one more thing about them. They presently have no waiting list. Now, that may change. Most companies have about six months out now waiting list. They don't. 
because they've been they've been um, gearing up for this for a long time. The number to call if you want information is one eight hundred three seven seven zero seven zero zero. You can call it right now, and you should, shouldn't you? One eight hundred three seven seven zero seven hundred. Tomorrow night, Ed Dames is going to be here. You're definitely not going to want to miss that one. He is going to give us the results of his viewing of the Devil's Workshop. Mike writes, uh, rather, he's in Armagosa Valley here in Nevada, and that's just cl very close by. And he writes something that's pretty sobering. Dear Art, two weeks ago, PBS Las Vegas Channel 10 aired an episode of The American Experience about the influenza epidemic of 1918, 400 to 600,000 dead. In October of 1918, 195,000 people died in America from influenza. On the show, they said the reason we don't see this in the history books is because it was so horrible that we virtually have more or less erased it from our national memory. This flu struck men in their prime, 25 to 35 years of age, more than any other group. A few facts you might not know about it. Of course, this flu struck everybody at every age. In the beginning, the government denied the problem. There was such a shortage of caskets that caskets became very valuable. Caskets had to be guarded in order to prevent theft. More people died of this epidemic than all of the wars in America combined. I never heard of any of this until the program aired. We really have erased this from our history. Can you imagine 195,000 people dying in one month? People wore masks that were clothed. For a virus, they said that was like trying to stop dust with chicken wire. The masks did nothing. They showed, in fact, photographs of baseball teams playing baseball with the masks on. All of that happened. West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. Hello. Um, I'm calling from uh, Idaho. Idaho. This is okay. Matthias. And uh, I'm calling about yesterday's show. Yes, sir. Um, something that struck me was that... Uh, he said that the conscious mind had no past memory. And uh, my thing was that if it had no memory, how could they um, recall this through hypnosis? Well, the no conscious recollection, sir. No conscious. The, okay. uh, the, the recollection uh, comes only through the unconscious. He was very clear about that. Okay. Uh, another thing you said that was uh, you had never controlled your dreams. I, no, he said, oh, no, I said, said, I have never controlled my dreams, and he said, me either, but there are people who claim to do that. Um, w well, I know how to. How? Um, it's a process of uh, conditioning your mind uh, through about a two- or three-week process, and what you do is uh, you have a normal watch that chimes you know, every half hour to hour, mm -hmm. and uh, when this happens... Uh, you simply look at your hand mm -hmm. and you count to f your fingers and then you look away and then you count them again and mm -hmm. you condition yourself by doing this and when you're dreaming if you count your fingers when you count them again a different number of fingers will appear because in dreams nothing appears the same twice that's pretty cool yeah, I, uh, I've... Uh, I want you to work on uh, if, if you're good at that then maybe you can work on something for me okay I want to be able to take some of what I have with me when I go. Mm -hmm. So, would you see what you can do in that arena? Um, what are you trying to ask me? Well, you know how they always say you can't take it with you. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to take it with me. So, how would you do that? Well, that's my question to you. I mean, you've done things I haven't, so help me out here. Okay. A car, maybe some radio equipment. <laughs> CD, bank account, women. Um, you know. Yeah, well, why don't you go ahead and try the uh, process of this and see how it works out for you? It takes a little while, and it's 
you know, it takes a little practice of it, but... I've gotten it down. You're referring to the dreams, right? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, all right. I'll, I'll give it a shot. I'm willing to try anything once, some things twice. Yeah. I, I, I think we need to start an entire new movement here. Now, I know this is not going to be considered particularly spiritual by some out there. But I'm tired of people telling me I can't take it with me. Now, think how that would change things if you could take things with you. It would change everything, wouldn't it? Our outlook on everything. If you could just take a few things with you, or even, even substantial numbers of things. Hell with inheritance. Take it with you. Uh, International Line, you're on the air. Hello. Hey, good evening, Art. Uh, good evening to you, sir. Trucking along in Canada somewhere. You got it. It's Jeff here again. Yes, sir. Uh, just uh, two things tonight. Thinking of the anniversary of the Phoenix Lights, wanted to say hi, Fritz. <laughs> and, uh, Fritz, you yes. know, you're talking about you know, being able to take it with you when you go? Yes. I think that's the person's perception of heaven. My perfect heaven is it's all going to be there when I get there. Well, I don't have to take it with me because it'll be waiting for me when I get there. Well, maybe it will. But, I mean, the way it works now, in the meantime, uh, your widow's going to be flying around in a new little uh, sporty car. Uh, you, you know. She can have her new little sporty car, because when I get up to heaven, it's going to be three women, a sports <laughs> car, hockey, <laughs> football. And, I mean, the, the fridge football. is going to be full of what I want. Yeah, I hear it's you. going to be there waiting for me. Women to bring you beer, right? You got it. All right, thanks for the call, sir. <laughs> She's in her little car. Huh? <laughs> West of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hello. Hey, how's it going, Art? Uh, well, it's going. <clears throat> anyway, um, I was just uh, wondering. I, I actually wish I could have talked to your uh, guest, but I never got the chance. You never had the open lines. You mean Peter? Yeah. Well, Peter, I, I guess you could do open lines, but um, it's not exactly a subject that necessarily lends itself to open lines because he's kind of reporting. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to see if they actually had done an autopsy on the uh, elk that they had found. Answer, no. Uh, no? They, they didn't. Um, but can you imagine an elk on uh, the forest floor for nine days without being touched by predators? No way. Actually, I used to work at a slaughterhouse, so I know exactly what it would be like. We've had some pretty nasty stuff go through there. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, another thing is, uh, potential theory... Um, what if they were supposedly abducting our animals to try and somehow create an alternative food source for themselves on their own planet? I mean, what happens if their their source of food doesn't grow say, as quick as ours? Because, I mean, within a year to two years, you have a full-grown animal. Well, I like Peter's idea of some sort of uh, E.T. barbecue going on on the far side of the moon. Yeah, hey, there you go. <laughs> right. Another thing. Yes? Um... I seen something in the sky tonight. Now I'm not saying alien or nothing, but what I seen looked like a meteor. And I was watching it, and it lasted about two seconds. But just at the end, yes, before it disappeared, it yes. let out a bright flash. Well, that happens. Um, that yeah. does happen. Yeah, it does happen, sir. In other words, uh, when it finally encounters uh, the thicker part of the atmosphere, there is virtually a detonation that does occur. So a meteor. I, I've seen meteors do that myself. Personally, I like the fireballs. First time caller line, you're on the air. Hello. Hi, Art. This turn, is uh, turn off your... from Colorado. Okay, off with the radio. Yeah, it's off. Good. And uh, I was um, calling in regards to what you said about the beginning of the show with um, with the children. Yes. Um, my mother in New York has like a, a little spiritual gift shop, and she knows an awful lot about that subject. And she says like when when children are young especially in infants and, and babies up to, like, three to four, they um, they kind of remember, like, their past life. And um, as they get older and they start to develop their uh, motor skills, they kind of forget. I know. So after a certain age, they just, uh, you know, since we don't teach them to remember, they uh, kind of forget about it. So if you were looking for somebody to talk to, you could probably be able to talk to my mother. Well, I'll tell you what. As the Hawaiians would say, every time I hear about one of these, it gives me chicken skin. <laughs> <laughs> it I really does. I mean, this one does freak me out a little bit. 
to hear first of all there's something about a child who barely has learned to talk talking about being an adult in a past life that just really freaks me out yeah i, I but i i really believe that you know that we, you know we uh do live in different lives and uh you know we keep living it until uh you know we have perfected it or we have mastered what we're supposed to accomplish or whatever but um as we get older from from a young kid we tend to forget those things that uh are in our past lives and you know i've done a past life regression with my mother before um you know and i really believe into it because uh you know i i saw myself as as a different person mm -hmm. and then um other people that are are in with m our lives are are in with our lives here you know as in this year all right. our lives now all right. they were connected with us before in in the past life and that and, uh, that may be that yeah, may be yeah cuz we you know me and my mother believe that uh, you know we've been with each other for uh many lifetimes you know uh, she's got a lot of we were just talking about this the other day you know she um <laughs> she believes that she had me as a child before and she was afraid that uh, that I was going to die, and she had that fear for me this you know this time around. And you didn't and, die. No, I didn't. And uh, you know she had a past life regression done, and the the child that she had before was me, and died like at uh, I think it was like eight years old, or, or you know somewhere around there. But after I was eight, she you know kind of lost the fear of it. So, um, and then finally a couple of weeks ago she had that done and she put, you know, put it together that, uh, that it was me before and, um, well, at know, least, at least there's some, uh, I appreciate it. So there's some progression. In other words, this time you didn't die if what you're saying is true. And I'm going to focus on this, taking it with you for a while. How do you suppose the world, if, you know, if you died and when you died, a whole bunch of stuff disappeared, like your car, and your wallet, and your bank book, and all your stuff, your TV and your stereo. All your stuff just <laughs> disappeared. You know, when, when, when you drew your last breath, and your eyes glazed over, and pupils dilated, and you, as Rush would say, assumed room temperature, if, if your stuff were to disappear at the same time, that really would change the world, wouldn't it? East of the Rockies, you're on the air. Hi. Good morning, Art Bill. Good morning. I'm Vini from Dallas. Dallas, Texas. Yes. Right. Um, that assassin story last night, I'm sorry. I just, I really got the impression of a redhead with that one. <laughs> which, which story? The assassin, the woman assassin with the uh, FBI. Oh, that a redhead, huh? Yeah, I think, I think, because they're pretty hot-headed. I think redhead had to have been the color of her hair. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> How is Richard doing tonight? I haven't heard anything yet. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I did report uh, at the beginning of the program. He is doing much better. He is now sitting up. As a matter of fact, we've got a photograph of Richard uh, with a fluorescent finger uh, tilted at about 19.5 degrees with all kinds of tubes attached to it in the hospital. Oh, yeah. yeah. So if you go to my website, you will see a photograph of Richard C. Post-operative. Looking uh, a little worse for the wear, to be sure. Not quite in the dapper category. You know, I mean, they, you, they open up your chest and stuff, and you're not that too dapper a day or so later. Now, let me tell you a little story at the expense of Keith Rowland, my webmaster. Some of you who may have gone to my website earlier tonight saw something that I think should be returned to the website. Uh, a gentleman, a very kind gentleman, I'd have to get on my site to recall his name, Keith could tell me, went to, was at the hospital and took some photographs of, of uh, Richard and scanned them and got them in so that we could have them <laughs> tonight. And they are on there now, or at least one is. Now, the first photograph he did a, a little enhancement of, and as a natural artifact of the enhancement, there was a halo over Richard's head. 
Uh, I say again, a natural artifact of the enhancement. Now, I got a lot of email about it saying, oh my God, there's a halo on Richard's head. And so I, I Keith mentioned it to me, and, and I said, come on, Keith, put it back. Let's see it. He said, well, I don't have it anymore. He said, I don't want to answer all the questions. So... Keith claims he doesn't have the photo any longer, but it was up earlier tonight for a short while. And I guess it really looked like Richard had a halo. I said, oh, come on, put it back. He said, no. So he's not going to put it back, I guess. <laughs> I would like myself to have seen that. Though, as well as I know Richard... Uh, a halo is rather un unlikely. I mean, I could think of a lot of things, but a halo... But then you never know. With so many people sending him so much energy, you just never know. So I, I really would like to see the photograph, but I guess there's going to be no chance. Keith has his feet in concrete on this one. He said, I'd have to answer all the email. Uh, International Line, you're on the air. Hello. Hi, it's Anna Ontario, and I listen to you on WPHT. In Philadelphia. Right. And you're you're where? In Ontario, in Muskoka. In on way up in Inter uh, Ontario. Right. You know, there's a station there in Ontario you could listen to. Has that occurred to you? Well, I'm glad for WPHT, but boy, that's a long haul. They only play your show for one hour. One from hour. Two a.m. to three a.m. That's oh, yeah. that's right. I heard that about that Ontario station that they picked us up, but they only play it for an hour right now, and everybody in Ontario should call them and tell right. them to carry more than that. Well, I've done that. I've got two things to tell you about. One was a story my mother-in-law told me, and it was about her daughter when she had just learned to talk. And she told her that when she was in heaven, they had to run a race. And she came in second, so she had to be born second. And there were four of them in the race. It was a race? A race in heaven when they were waiting to be born. Wow. And I never forgot that story. And, of course, my mother-in-law had four children, and this daughter was number two. And it just really startled me and made me think for a long time, that story. Well, um, I'll tell you this. It all gives me chicken skin. Every time I hear one.